We continue today looking uh, through a brief study on the Holy Spirit. I'm thinking that we'll have one more message on that uh, probably by the end of the year, and then we'll move on. Uh, we've already had two messages on the Holy Spirit, looking at His divinity, His place within the Trinity, and His personality. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, co-equal with the Father and the Son. Also, He is to be distinguished from the Father and the Son as a person, possessing a will, attributes, and divine works. Uh, we saw last week, we went through many of His activities through the Scriptures. And of course, if we went through all of His activity, we would be here for a very long time. But we briefly looked at His activities in creation. At the very beginning of the Bible, we find the Holy Spirit involved. We find Him contending with men in their sins at the flood. And we find Him in the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we read uh, in the Westminster Confession this morning. And we find Him in the work of empowering the preaching of the Word of God. And today we're going to get a little more personal in the work of the Holy Spirit. And we've seen His work in the prophets, in the apostles, and in the church. And today we're going to look at His work in the salvation of the sinner. You know, our current evangelical culture tends to focus primarily on the work of the Son. And there's nothing wrong with that, obviously, that uh, we need to focus upon the work of of our Lord Jesus Christ, His coming to earth, His perfect life, His sacrificial death, His resurrection, His ascension. And we see uh, many times the evidence of this, the people desire to get the word out of what Jesus has done, and you'll see the term, Jesus saves. Uh, you'll find it sometimes that uh, maybe if you're watching a ball game, someone will hold up a sign that says Jesus saves, or, or you'll see it on the bumper of a car, you know, or something. Or Actually, there's a, a church on the way to Pittsburgh. They call it the Jesus Saves Church because it has a little sign on the top that says Jesus saves. And I actually remember that. I had to go to Pittsburgh as a, as a child uh, one time for an operation, and I remember driving those, this is before the new roads were, were put in, driving old 22 and driving by that church a couple of times, uh, seeing uh, Jesus saves on top of the church. So we know about that. You know, that that's one of the obvious messages of the age, that Jesus saves. Uh, but we cannot view this as the only work of God in salvation, that, that Christ is uh, alone in His work in salvation, because it is a work of the Trinity. I believe we, we touched on this, that every person of the Trinity has a part in the salvation of sinners. One of the commentators said, Salvation is purposed by the Father, accomplished by the Son, and applied by the Holy Spirit. Each member of the Trinity is essential in bringing the sinner to salvation. To make the sinner fit for eternal life. The, the entire Trinity is involved in this. The Father's work in the Trinity in His purposing salvation in eternity past. Uh, starting with his foreknowledge, Romans, you can read that in Romans chapter 8. It's called the, the chain, the golden chain of redemption. You have his foreknowledge. Now, some people believe that God looks down and, and sees, oh, this, people, this person is going to believe in me or this person, so I'll elect that person. That's not how it works you know, when you look at the Scriptures. The Scriptures use the term foreknowledge because the word foreknowledge means to know ahead of time. To know and to love and to desire to establish a relationship with. So, through eternity past, the Father foreknew His children. He knew us before we existed in the past. He predestined us to eternal life. This is what John 3.16 is all about. For God so loved the world. This is what the Lord meant when he said that no one could come to him except the persons that were given to him of his father. John chapter 6 and verse 37. The father then sends the son who then willingly comes to earth to accomplish the father's will. Now we've seen this also in the unseen work in God's providence. Now where we are placed in a position to hear the word of God. 
uh, where we have many people in the world that are uh, in places where they don't hear the gospel. They are involved perhaps in a false religion or they're uh, involved in nothing at all and no care for the gospel at all. Uh, perhaps the gospel is suppressed, and as in the case of North Korea, where to even have a Bible puts one's life in danger. Uh, but yet we have uh, God places at particular times, particular places and time. He puts his people to be able to hear and uh, to believe then in the word of God. The Father has a people, not only to himself, who have been chosen before the foundation of the world, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. These are his sheep who hear his voice, who hear the voice of Christ, and uh, come to him in John uh, chapter 10. So we have the work of the Father. Then we also have the work of the Son. So we mentioned the Son willingly came to earth at Christmas to take on humanity as the second Adam. The purpose of his coming was to undo what had occurred with the first Adam. The first Adam brought sin and death. The second Adam comes to bring life, uh, to bring deliverance from sin and life. Uh, so he came as the Lamb of God to take all the sin of those given to him by the Father upon himself. He suffers death, uh, that we, uh, he, he suffers the death that we should die. And seals with it his resurrection from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he continues then to intercede on our behalf. This is the work of the Son. By him we have propitiation. That is, the wrath of God is satisfied in the Son. We are freed from sin's penalty and guilt by the work of of the Son. So we have all this. We have the work of the Father, we have the work of the Son, yet it is of no avail unless it is applied to the sinner through the work of the Spirit. The, work, uh, the focus of the Holy Spirit is in the application of the desire and work of the Father and the Son for the salvation of men. He brings all of this to reality. Uh, nothing could be realized in human experience apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. This is absolutely essential. We must have the work of the Spirit in salvation. This is where I hope to focus on today and to give us a good foundation of understanding the work of the Spirit uh, in the salvation of God. You know, the Holy Spirit, as we mentioned before, has, uh, He has been greatly abused, misunderstood, and actually blasphemed by many in this generation. We, we need to go back to the Scriptures. Uh, once again, a commentator has said, Without the Spirit's agency in salvation, all that Christ has accomplished brings no value to us. As Scripture uniformly presents, the Spirit graciously, effectively, and permanently gives us Christ Jesus and every <coughs> blessing He has secured. Our salvation is in Christ alone. Our salvation is by His Spirit Alone, So we must understand that the work of the Spirit is essential in salvation. And how does this occur? Well, we read a very familiar passage in John chapter 3. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. John chapter 1 lays the foundation for that. Verses 11 through 13. He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. They are born of God, or born of the Spirit. John chapter 3, verse 6, as we read, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Titus chapter 3, verse 5, we also read, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. 
There is so much involved in this, it's difficult to separate and break down the work of the Spirit, but I really hope to be able to do some of that to give us an idea. What's involved in this work of the Spirit, or regeneration, or the giving of life from the Spirit? John 6, 63 says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Unless we have this great work of the Spirit, there is no profit to us of all the, what we've read in the Scripture. Spirit must bring life to us. So the, the first thing I believe that occurs in the work of the Spirit is what is called a quickening or a making of alive of that which was dead. As we mentioned, the Spirit, it is the Spirit who gives life. And the simple definition of regeneration is the new birth in which the Holy Spirit imparts real spiritual life into the elect. We who are spiritually dead, unresponsive, uncaring when it comes to the things of God, we have no desire for the things of God, we must be made alive or quickened. As you see Adam receiving life uh, and that creation being breathed into him by God, so it must be to our dead spirits that are dead in trespasses and sins. I'll look to Ephesians chapter 2, if you would. Again, a familiar passage, but let's take a, a look at it. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. We'll look at that and then verse 18. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. That is the, the situation of every human being that comes into this world, where we are children of wrath just as everybody else. But, verse 4, God who is rich in mercy because of His great love which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Look down then to verse 18. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So you see the Trinity there in that verse, uh, verse 18. And the access comes by that one Spirit. He is that life-giving Spirit. This is an instantaneous thing. Now, it is not a, the new birth is not a process, you know, where it starts at one point and slowly, gradually works its way until finally you're born. No, the new birth is instantaneous. Now, what gets us to that point might be a long process, but when it happens, it is as the birth of a child. The child is born and then uh, the child enters this world. Uh, it is not a work of man, but of God. We believe in what is called monergism, that it is God who works in the salvation of men. Uh, we are but passive recipients of His grace. Uh, we don't do anything that merits the favor of God. It is God who looks upon us in His favor and grants to us uh, the salvation of God. John 6, 65, and He said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to Me unless it has been granted to him by My Father. The condition of man is such that he is incapable of stirring himself up from his spiritual stupor to come to God. The, the, the situation that you are in uh, spiritually, you are unable to come. Take a look at, at 1 Corinthians, if you would. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is the condition of man. At verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. 
But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the Spirit of the, of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We're able to do these things because of the work of the Spirit in us. But look at verse 14. What if the Spirit was not, not present? But the natural man, this is the man without the Spirit, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. It is the Spirit who awakens the sinner. Romans chapter 8 and verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. And so we, we have this, this condition that we are in of complete hopelessness, complete spiritual stupor, no desire for the things of God, but it is the Holy Spirit who comes and awakens us and alters all of that and brings to us life. Man does not assist God in any way. The Spirit acts upon the individual and resurrects them from spiritual death. Just as Christ called Lazarus from the tomb, who had been dead for four days and stank. He calls him alive from the tomb. So the Holy Spirit does to the dead soul of men. This is an enlightening work. The Spirit enlightens. He brings light into darkness. You know, this illumination is to be able to see what was once unseen. There is a, a point in life, in the spiritual life, when this occurs. And then it, it occurs continually as we see the things, as we, we, we experience the things of God and read uh, the Word of God. He brings all these things to light. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we, we have this darkness that, we, that veils us as sinners. The Holy Spirit, when He enters, enlightens. He turns the light on for us. And like the blind man in John chapter 9, we're able to say, One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. The Word of God meant nothing to me at all. The things of God. You know, I go along with a few things to keep relatives happy. Uh, you don't want to be that, that one kid in the family which causes all the trouble, so you go along. But religion became real when the Holy Spirit entered my life. He awakened me, and He saw, He, he, saw, he, he helped me to see the value, the eternal value of the Word of God. Uh, we did not see the love of God, <coughs> His holiness, the beauty of Christ, we're blind to all of this. The value of the Word, or the depth of our sin. All of this and much more is brought to light by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit turns on the light to the things of God and his, to His Word, and enables us to understand what we cannot understand by nature. So if it were not for the blessed Holy Spirit, you would remain in spiritual darkness. The Holy Spirit also brings conviction of sin. John chapter 16, verse 8, the Lord said, And when He has come, that is the Holy Spirit, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So there's, there's a conviction of sin that is brought uh, when the Holy Spirit enters the life. Now this is more than a mere acknowledgement of sin. Uh, we we know, we can understand that even natural men, people who have nothing to do with things of God, have a guilty conscience at times. That is because the image of God remains in them, and so whenever they, they do wrong things, they know it's wrong. It's, it's much more than that, though. Uh, it, it goes deeper than that. The, we, we, it, it's deeper than knowing that we're in trouble. It's deeper than knowing that we're going to face judgment. It's, you know, people try to deny the judgment of God that's coming on mankind. You know, and uh, you go to college, 
and the college will educate out of you any type of religion that you might have had. You know, uh, you don't have to worry about it. You're just an animal that evolved up from a slug or something, so you don't have to worry about that. You just live the life you have. You know, they, they teach you all that stuff, and they try to educate it out of you. But people know that there is coming a judgment of God. You know, all you have to do is go into a trench in a war somewhere uh, and, and where you have bullets and, and bombs exploding around where how people all of a sudden start thinking about God. God, help me. You know, uh, even they may be atheists all their life, but whenever uh, the foxhole has, uh, comes, that foxhole religion uh, makes itself known. That's because people know this uh, it, uh, deep down inside that it's true. There is a conscience. You know, I was thinking, I was, I was uh, reading a book, uh, Joe Conica, one of the pastors that I'm associated with, recommended I read a book on the Holocaust, and I think it's called Ordinary Men. And I was reading this book, and it was talking about the guards at these concentration camps, you know, where they had been former policemen, or just regular people, and they were conscripted, or they volunteered, and they were, were, were uh, to be guards at a prison camp, so they thought, and then they were told to lead out women and children and to shoot them. Uh, and uh, the, the experience of some of these men, how they, they some of them broke down and couldn't do it. You know, and uh, some, uh, they, they would do it and, and, and it would affect them and they would do it again and again and again. And it just became second, second nature to them and the murders of what, what they were doing. This is, this is the conscience of man. True conviction involves more than that, uh, more than the fear of judgment. Although that may serve as an introduction to true conviction, but it's more than a fear of judgment. Uh, many times, natural man experiences this and, and responds with hatred or even violence rather than repentance. True conviction is to see the true hideous nature of our own sin. It is an understanding of personal guilt. It is an understanding of our lack of holiness. It is seeing the holiness of God because the Holy Spirit is now with us and we now see the holiness of God and in seeing that we see how far short we fall and then the conviction of sin uh, is, is, is there as something that is genuine. A true conviction is when we recognize our own lack of holiness that we in ourselves bring nothing acceptable to God. We can't because how, how deep our sin is. And that then drives us to the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 7, verse uh, 9 and 10. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow pr produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So we must distinguish between the natural conviction of being caught or exposed or, or fear of, of judgment and the work of the Holy Spirit, which when He comes brings hatred of sin. And anything that comes between us and God, this is the work of the Spirit. And conviction. The Holy Spirit also draws. We are told in the Scriptures, John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. The fallen humanity is quite content to remain as they are, lying under the sway of the wicked one, under Satan. They are slaves to sin and Satan. And they love it that way. They want it to stay that way. They prefer what they already have. And when the opportunity arises to turn from their idols and embrace Christ, they refuse. I don't want that. They love this present world more than the riches of Christ. This is the, 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 by nature what man is by nature. They certainly don't want to bear the reproach of Christ. You know, we look at the parable of the Great Supper in Luke chapter 14 where you have uh, the uh, uh, man inviting all those people to the, to the supper. And what, how did they respond? Verse 18, it says, But they all with one accord began to make excuses. And how many times have we talked to people about their eternal souls? They said, well, I, uh, not right now. I've got other things I need to worry about right now in life. And, you know, uh, they make excuses. 
That's the natural man. The Spirit alters all of this through revealing to the heart the love of God. When Christ is lifted up, the Spirit reveals to us what is really happening on the cross. This is the love of God on display. And it is this goodness of God that leads us to repentance. We see His goodness. Why we see Christ not merely as a martyr or as a good teacher that was mistreated or, or whatever. We see Him as the Son of God who came for our sin and the love of God that's displayed to us. And that love of God draws us then uh, to Him and to repentance. We realize how wonderful the love of God is and see the beauty and glory of Jesus Christ and cannot help but be drawn to Him. And as the Greeks which came to the apostles with the request in John chapter 12, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans 5.5 5, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We see God's love on display, and we cannot help but love Him in return. We love Him because He first loved us. The Spirit opens our eyes to see the love of God in Christ, and to see Him who loved us and washed us from His sins in His own blood. We see all of this, and we understand it. This is the work of the Spirit. We are led by His love to forsake all and follow Him. We come to the point where we can say, Take the world and give me Jesus. For He alone is the pearl of great price. It is the Holy Spirit who reveals these things to us, working faith and repentance in our hearts. The Holy Spirit also comforts us. It is through the Holy Spirit that we have assurance. Now you think of assurance. Assurance is, is one of those things which can be very difficult because we look at our sins and we say, how could I be a Christian? You know, uh, uh, we fall into a particular sin. I remember uh, not long after I had made a profession of faith, and uh, I, I think I was saved then. I, I mean, I, I, I think. I, it was a long, long time ago. Uh, but me and my brother, I was still a teenager. Me and my brother got into a fight, and I gave him a good rap, and he fell into the closet, and I thought I broke his leg, and something was, oh, no. And I thought... I'm supposed to be a Christian. How could, how could I be a Christian and do that? And so assurance is a difficult thing sometimes. But it is the Spirit who grants to us this assurance. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts which confirms that we indeed are children of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. Now he who establishes us with you in, for he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. How do I know I'm a Christian? Now, I, uh, a person can believe all the things that the Bible teaches and not be a Christian. But how do we really know that it's real? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. As we, as the temple of God, God comes in and dwells within us and brings with Him that convicting power that reveals to us our eternal destiny. It's our love of the truth. Where does that come from? Why do we love the Bible? Why do we wish to worship? Why do we love our neighbor? Why do we love the fel the, the, our fellow Christians, our believers and, uh, fellow believers in the church? Why do we have this? Why are we drawn to the church for worship? Why is the Word of God opening up to us? All of that is an evidence of the Spirit and His presence in us. Romans chapter 8, verse 16, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There is something now present in the heart that wasn't there before. Now, so then, uh, we have scratched the surface of the Holy Spirit's work in salvation. The question then remains, has this been your experience? There's something called experiential knowledge, and there's something called academic knowledge. You can go to college and learn everything you need to know about a particular subject, but never experience that whatsoever 
and you get on the field and say, oh, well, now what do I do? And have all this knowledge, but how do I put it into effect? Uh, there's experiential knowledge where we experience it. We, we learn it through actually experiencing it. Have you been brought under the convicting power when the word is preached? Or is the word of God a dead letter? You know, the word of God's being read or preached. Yeah, you know, oh well. well, let's see, when's this going to be over with? Is the word of God real to your heart? Does it speak to your heart? Has sin become loathsome to you? Or do you still embrace it as a friend? What is sin to you? It ought, it ought to, to bring a terror to you if you have a love of sin. Now, sin is going to be very attractive to even the Christian. We still have that uh, remnants of the old nature we're going to battle with until we die. Uh, Romans chapter 7. But at the same time, is sin something we anticipate and wish for and want? And love? Or is it something that we hate and despise and cry out to God, Lord, deliver me from this? That's the work of the Spirit. Have you come to see the beauty and glory of Jesus Christ? Do you know Him for who He is? When you see Him, do you fall down on your face in awe and, and, and worship Him for who He is and thank Him for what He has done for us? Or is he just another person on a page of history to you? The Holy Spirit will bring him to light. It is the Holy Spirit who brings all of this to light and this new life that we have from within. And let me close uh, by, writing, uh, writing, by reading some of the writings of A.W. Pink who wrote on the Holy Spirit. And I thought this is so appropriate and we, we'll close with this. To God the Holy Spirit be the glory of His sovereign grace in working faith in the heart of the writer, that's Him, and of each Christian reader. You have attained peace and joy in believing, but have you thanked that peace bringer, the Holy Spirit? All that joy unspeakable and full of glory, and that peace which passes all understanding, to whom is it ascribed? The Holy Spirit. It is particularly appropriated to Him. Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Then render unto Him the praise that is His due. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord God, may You apply the Word to our hearts. Oh, Lord, help us to recognize when the Holy Spirit is present with us. Help us to be submissive to the, His work in our hearts as we hear the Word. And He empowers us to obey. May we do so. Lord, we pray that we give Him the glory for what He does. And Lord, help those who are here who perhaps have not experienced any of this. That religion is just another thing in, in life to, to do but it's not something of the heart. I pray, Lord, that you would do that work which only you can do in their heart. Reveal to them the glory of God and the beauty of Christ and the depth of their sin, that they may flee to him and be saved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.